All I have now is this, my prime radiant. This is the means by which psychohistory can be computed, through which every equation in my plan may be analyzed. All here in this amazing small black cube, what I see before me, around me, is the future of humanity. 30,000 years of potential chaos compressed into a single millennium. Hey guys, Pete here. Today I'm going to look at Isaac Asimov's fictional science of psychohistory. With the upcoming Apple TV Plus series, I decided to explain this in the most spoiler-free way. I'm going to focus on how it was introduced in the original Foundation stories, and at least for now, stay away from the conclusions in history that Asimov tacked on when he came back to revisit the series in the 1980s. Not because those things aren't important, but because they give away some important information that could take away from the ending. In simple terms, psychohistory is the mathematical study of the course of humanity. It looks at how large groups or mobs of people react in response to things like economic and social stimuli. In modern terms, we would think of it as a data science that can be used to generate probabilistic predictions of future events. This doesn't work on the level of individuals. Asimov modeled the concept on the kinetic theory of gases. In his own words, he described it like this. The molecules making up gases moved in an absolutely random fashion in any direction in three dimensions and in a wide range of speeds. Nevertheless, one could fairly describe what those motions would be on the average and work out the gas laws from those average motions with an enormous degree of precision. In other words, although one couldn't possibly predict what a single molecule would do, one could accurately predict what uptillions of them would do. So I applied that notion to human beings. Each individual human being might have free will, but a huge mob of them should behave with some sort of predictability, and the analysis of mob behavior was my psychohistory. It's a social science, and later in his career, Asimov conceded that he should have named it psychosociology instead, but at the time, he was so intent on using the word history because he got the idea for the story from his second reading of Edward Gibbon's The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. The mathematician Harry Selden spent his life developing psychohistory, and in the process learned that it predicted the fall of the Galactic Empire. Harry developed what would become known as Selden's plan to shorten the human suffering in the gap between the fall of the first and the rise of the new empire. This is what he's referring to in the reading I opened the video with. Psychohistory predicts that after the empire falls, that will be followed by 30,000 years of chaos and barbarism. If applied, the Selden plan can shorten that to 1,000 years by accelerating the pace of developing the Second Empire, which is guided by the Foundations. Right around here, you might be thinking that psychohistory can solve all of humanity's problems and usher in utopia. It would actually make for a pretty dull story if you think it through. Where things start off in the original trilogy is that psychohistory and the Selden plan have been developed, but the fall of the Galactic Empire, that's too far along to be prevented. This is made more complicated because on the surface, things seem to be going fine, especially for those that hold power in the Empire. Nobody wants to hear or believe what Harry Selden has to say, and to keep things interesting, Asimov added some logical axioms that are necessary for psychohistory to be effective. Selden himself established the original pair of these. The first is that the population whose behavior was modeled should be sufficiently large. This reinforces that it can't be applied to the actions of individuals or situations involving small groups within a population. Second, that the population should remain in ignorance of the results of the application of psychohistorical analyses because if it is aware, the group changes its behavior. This is where things get interesting and where most of the tension in the first book comes from. You can develop a plan, but telling too many people how it works undermines its effectiveness. This is because it works best with a limited amount of independent variables, and where free will is somewhat constrained. 
To put it simply, people have to agree to follow a plan that they don't understand more or less blindly, and then it's going to take several generations before it's realized. It's not a spoiler to say that Foundation covers a lot of ground time-wise. It moves through more than three centuries over the first three books. While it doesn't make it to the thousand-year mark to see the conclusion of Selden's plan, the final book in the series chronologically, Foundation and Earth, takes place nearly 500 years after Harry Selden dies. In that time, new axioms are added to keep up with the twists that Asimov introduces to keep things interesting. After all, if everyone just followed psychohistory and everything went smoothly, it wouldn't be very exciting, and it also wouldn't much resemble the humanity that we know. If the TV show lasts long enough to produce the seven seasons they're hoping for, we'll get to see how the existence of psychohistory affects things and how Selden's plan unfolds for the Foundations. There are two of them, and Harry set it up that way from the beginning, and although I guess that's a different video altogether, it is worth mentioning that the two Foundations are set up to operate independently, with the second doing so in secret. So while Harry isn't telling very many people what he knows is in store for humanity, psychohistory does provide a plan that gives them the best opportunity to make it to the point where the second empire is established. The plan also recognizes that there will be crises along the way. So even though Harry Selden isn't immortal, he does die of old age early in the story, he has things set up where he can still influence the foundations at key moments in their development. In the show, you'll see how he manages that when they reach the first predicted crisis. In a video like this, I guess it makes sense to ask the question, is psychohistory something that could work? Can we see something like this in the real world? Your guess is as good as mine. If you go looking for them, there are plenty of essays, discussions, and debates out there. You can find arguments for and against psychohistory being viable. I lean towards the skeptical side. I don't think that we'll ever see anything that works as precisely as psychohistory. I like the idea. It develops an interesting situation, and I especially like seeing how different characters react to that over multiple generations. Basing it on the kinetic theory of gases is a novel idea, but are molecules and people comparable? The human brain, the human condition and behavior, it all seems too complicated to express mathematically. Then again, if humanity is still around in 20,000 years, who's to say? To be fair, when he came up with this concept, personal computers were a long way off. It's interesting to see how things have developed in data science, but the applications don't seem to be moving in that direction. Either way, it makes for an interesting series of stories, so it doesn't matter if it ever becomes a reality. One last thing, in the passage I opened with, it mentioned the prime radiant. That's the device that stores the psychohistorical equations which show the future development of humanity. It's basically a big map of what's going to happen. The equations are projected, and the operator can zoom in to look at the details and even change things. It is the psychohistorian's tool, and there's only a few of them out there. And I think that's a good place to leave things. It looks like the show's going to be airing on Apple TV in September. There's no official release date yet, though. That might mean we'll get a full trailer soon, maybe next month, and I can't wait to see that. you still got time to dip into the book, so I'll put links to those in the description. I think at this stage, you'd have to start with the book foundation and then finish the original trilogy. From there, you could decide if you wanted to go into the robot series or how you wanted to approach the books that came out in the 80s. The one strong recommendation I would make is to not read the Foundation prequels until last. The second prequel, Forward the Foundation, is the last book Asimov wrote before he died, and that adds some weight to ending the series with it. It also brings things full circle in a satisfying way, and there really isn't any reason I can think of to read it in chronological order, unless you just want to diminish the mystery of Harry Selden and get spoiled on how the series ends at the very beginning. I reread all 15 books this year, including the Empire series, which isn't completely essential, and that's a big investment of time, so it'll all depend on how much you want to get into it. Let me know what you think in the comments. 
If you have questions about psychohistory or about the series, let me know. If you've already read the books, what are you most looking forward to seeing? If you want to talk spoilers, that's fine, but just mark those accordingly. Don't give away the twists. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.